Hey all, thanks for having me back. So, uh, as always, Lisa gave me a lot of permission to kind of do whatever I wanted, so uh, be warned. Uh, now, as those of you who've seen me speak before may be aware, I like to have some fun with things. We're going to play a little game called Kahoot, so have those cell phones ready to go, and uh, we're going to try and compete for some wonderful prizes today. So disclosures, I know this is a CEU event. I don't have anything to, to disclose, any conflicts of interest related to anything that, that we're going to talk about here today. So we're going to start with a warm-up case. Um, let's maybe get our, our phones ready to go here. So uh, the warm-up case is four college-age boys who get their hands on some cases of beer and manage to consume all of that. And then somebody comes up with a brilliant idea to throw some ecstasy in the mix. And there happens to be a chance viewing of the wonderful movie called Jackass on MTV, where people get intoxicated and do really dangerous things. And uh, there happens to be a fish tank in the room where they're watching Jackass. And that fish tank has eight goldfish in it. We can do math, eight goldfish, four college boys. So they all drink a glass of water with two goldfish in it, and they think it's hilarious, right? So they get to the end of the goldfish, and there is a two and a half inch bronze catfish, one of the garbage fish that are in there and clean up the tank. So what do you think happens next? The drunkest of the four decides to drink the catfish. This is pretty abruptly followed by <laughs> profound hematemesis. So the three less drunk guys uh, bring this vomiting dude to the emergency room. And our first Kahoot question then is, what do you think that the ICU imaging showed? Get ready. Do you think it showed a tracheal foreign body hit the red uh, triangle, an esophageal foreign body, the blue diamond, liver cirrhosis, the yellow circle, or an esophageal rupture hit the green square? Five seconds, five seconds, get those answers in. You get more points if you get it correct, and the faster you, you get it in, uh, the more points you get. Excellent. 19 people thought he popped his esophagus. Four of you got it right. So let's look at our leaderboard. Sandy, charge into the top of things here. Excellent. We'll come back in and revisit this again shortly. Yeah, so here's the image, and we can see a not-so-happy catfish impacted in this guy's esophagus here. So obviously gastroenterology got called and they found Nemo. I told you, Lisa told me I could do whatever I want. So, you know, you're stuck with this for an hour, friends. Let's get serious. Case number one, never put money in your mouth because you don't know where it's been. How many times has your mom told you that, right? So this is a case of a 27-year-old uh, white female who got transferred to the VA's uh, intensive care unit. Uh, from Plattsmouth. Uh, she was brought by EMS and followed by the Nebraska State Troopers. So the back story is she was in a known drug house somewhere around Plattsmouth and there was a, a gang unit raid on that house. She ran out the back door and barricaded herself in the shed, told the police she had weapons and they better not come in. Well, they came in anyhow and found her ingesting a bunch of, of drugs. Uh, she then has a seizure, and they said, oh, it was the worst fake seizure we, we've ever seen. So they go ahead and put the cuffs on her, throw her in the back uh, of the car. Uh, somebody says, well, you know, we could get in trouble with the boss if we don't take this seriously. So they took her to the ER, and she has a real seizure there. And they look in her medical records, and oh, by the way, she has a known seizure disorder and is on Dilantin. They do her testing, it comes back positive for alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and meth, but negative for any Dilantin. So she's self-medicating the wrong way, I would argue here. So after this witness seizure in the Plattsmouth ER, they admit her to get her seizure under control. She's got a lot of skin wounds from all of her drug abuse, and they say, well, those need some attention too. And over the next couple of days, uh, she develops pretty bad alcohol withdrawal syndrome. She gets hypotensive and tachycardic. 
very combative and agitated. She keeps complaining when she's uh, more alert and conscious of some vague abdominal pain. Uh, they get a CT of the belly, it's negative. She subsequently has a positive UA and they start appropriate antibiotic therapy, but she gets sicker and sicker, so finally they say, let's send her to, to Omaha. So on day six, she got sent to me for a worsening mental status and this urinary tract infection. When she showed up, she was in fluorid septic shock. It was very timely that Dr. Penn just told you about, you know, 50% mortality in folks who got septic shock. I mean, she's febrile to almost 105. Blood pressure is dicey at 80s over 40s. You can see all those numbers look horrible. She's obviously volume depleted, uh, hypoactive bowel sounds. It's really firm, not rigid, but firm, and very tender everywhere, but more so suprapubic. Uh, the extremities were cool and clammy, and if you look on the screen here, you can see this petechial sort of rash that she's got everywhere uh, on her body, including in her uh, mucosa of her mouth, and she's starting to actually slough off some skin, so we are very worried about her. She gets sedated, gets intubated, central line, arterial line, a bunch of fluids, aggressive antibiotics. The labs come back, and of course, they look horrific too, right? Her lactate comes back at nine, and as you just heard, a lactate over two is a really scary observation. We wanted to get a CT because we figured her belly was the engine for the sepsis, but she was too unstable to go. So instead, uh, we got a KUB uh, at the time we were getting a chest X-ray to verify the endotracheal tube and central line placement. And here's her KUB, sort of focusing you in on the most interesting finding here. So the question is, what should we do now? So get ready to go here, get those phones woken up. What should we do now? Repeat the physical exam, get a belly CT, call surgeons, or repeat the history to see if we missed something. Yeah, six of you agreed with me that we should repeat the physical uh, repeat the physical exam. So let's go see where this goes. Why did I say we should do the physical? Well, let me tell you, as a pulmonologist, if you want to become a legend in the ICU, you ask for a speculum. <laughs> so when I did a pelvic exam in the intensive care unit, I think the first time in recorded history at Creighton Medical Center, we pulled out a wad of $100 bills. So I bring this case up because what it was was a case of non-menstrual toxic shock syndrome. And everybody heard about toxic shock syndrome with the old tampons and all of that, right? That's what we all learned. Well, that's not what it's about anymore. And it's uh, occurring in uh, men. About 10% of cases now of this non-menstrual toxic shock syndrome uh, are, are, are in men, and almost all of those are in the post-operative setting. But the reason I wanted to recircle around to this case is because the mortality is ridiculously high in folks who have non-menstrual toxic shock syndrome. And that's because the bug that causes this is a Staph aureus strain, and toxic shock, whether it's menstrual or non-menstrual, it's a toxin-mediated illness. And when we see this, we know that we've got a Staph aureus bug that is spewing out humongous amounts of a very, very virulent toxin. And the good news is the bacteria are generally pretty antibiotic susceptible. So in this case, we removed the foreign body, put on some nafcillin, and she got dramatically uh, better quickly. Now I thought, case number two I've titled cough, cough, cough. If you have a bad cough, take laxatives and you'll be afraid to cough. <laughs> So this case is a 73-year-old white male veteran uh, who showed up in clinic for evaluation of a chronic cough. Um, he was one of these guys who sort of scheduled six or eight weeks out, and then they called back and said, oh, I'm not sure we can wait because having some hemoptysis as well. So we worked him in sooner. He's got no past medical history. 73-year-old guy, no past medical history, no medications. I think that's pretty uh, phenomenal. On physical exam, it's pretty much unremarkable. He's already had a very extensive and kind of haphazard workup by his primary care physician. It's all been uh, uh, negative, uh, and that's why he's being sent to us. So we went back through his, his uh, workup that had been done, and we saw chest x-ray here. Let you ponder that for a second. 
And he'd also had a CT uh, of his chest done. And I've got a, a section sliced through his lung here. So the question for you all is, you know, the answer is here in these images, but can you identify what the images I'm showing you are intended to represent? Is this a lung cancer, a bronchosuis, a cardiac bronchus, or heart failure? Four people got it, a cardiac bronchus. Oh my goodness, Sandy's still atop our leaderboard here. So what the hell is bronchus, suus, and cardiac bronchus? Oh my gosh. So realize that your tracheobronchial tree doesn't have, generally speaking, a lot of anatomic variation. When I run a bronchoscope down into your lungs, I know where everything is based on knowing the anatomy of the tracheobronchial tree. There is a very, very rare anomaly here called this cardiac bronchus, and we'll look at the imaging again here in just a second. This is where you actually have an extra bronchus inside your lungs, and it comes right off the bronchus intermedius in your right tracheobronchial tree, and it comes sort of inferior and medially back towards the heart, so that's why we call it the cardiac bronchus. It's usually asymptomatic, but it can get infected or cause hemoptysis, like in this guy, and then we have to deal with it. So if here is the, the you know, the mouth is up here and the trachea is coming down, we get to the main carina, you got your right lung over here, your left lung over here. Uh, this is the right main stem bronchus, and the first thing we always see is a takeoff to the right upper lobe. And then this segment down here is what we call the bronchus intermedius. It divides and goes to the middle lobe and the lower lobe. With the cardiac bronchus, you got this little nub over here that, again, is coming medially and kind of inferiorly, and the heart would sit here. So this is the cardiac bronchus. So trachea trivia time, my friends. We got two more Kahoot questions. The first one says, which mammal has the right upper lobe bronchus? coming directly off the trachea. And the second trivia question, which mammal has a single plural space for both lungs? Are you ready? Which mammal, right upper lobe bronchus, coming off the trachea rather than off the right main stem bronchus? Is it the pig, the armadillo, the beaver, or the cow? Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, everybody's groaning right there with you. Yeah, it's the pig, the pig, excellent. RT, to the lead. So let's get to our next trivia question. Which mammal has a single plural cavity that houses both lungs? Is it the gerbil, the whale, the buffalo, or is it Donald J. Trump? <laughs> Here we go, two people got it right, the buffalo. Excellent, excellent. RT, still in the lead here. So. Let's go back to my meanderings here. So <laughs> bronchus suus, which was one of the choices three questions ago, is uh, the pig bronchus. Suus is pig. And pigs are interesting because their trachea comes down, and before this right uh, main stem bronchus comes off, look what happens. There's a little offshoot that goes directly from the trachea into the right upper lobe. And when we look down with the bronchoscope, what we would normally expect to see is the carina here, the right main stem bronchus here, the left main stem bronchus. Very, 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 very rarely do we see a pig bronchus in people. So see that hole over there? Shouldn't be there, but it goes right into the right upper lobe. Should be down here, uh, down the, the right main stem bronchus. So this is another anatomic variant. Now the cardiac bronchus is an extra bronchus. This is just a improperly located bronchus, so it's a little bit different. Anybody here seen Dances with Wolves? Yeah? So do you remember the scene where Kevin Costner goes and tells the, the tribe of Indians, the, the Tatanka, the, the buffalo are here, right? And they run out there and what do they do? You got all these Native American Indians sitting on these semi-wild horses, no saddle, no reins. They're just controlling them with their legs. And then they got a bow made out of a stick and a piece of string, shooting an arrow that's made out of a stick, some feathers, and a sharp rock on the end of it, right? And what happens? Shoot the buffalo, and what do they do? Fall over immediately. Dirt goes flying everywhere. You win a, uh, uh, an Oscar for cinematography, right? 
People go deer hunting and they shoot a deer and what happens? It runs for a mile and then they got to go find it, right? Are you kidding me? A high-powered rifle can't drop a deer, but a stick and rock can kill a buffalo? Fast forward about 10 years when I'm in medical school and uh, uh, I learned that that's actually true. So buffalo have one plural space. So all you have to do is make any small hole in there and they get a pneumothorax of both lungs simultaneously. You shoot a deer and you blow out one lung, well, he can live on the other one and run a mile, right? So this is one of those things where trivia, physiology kind of fascinate me. So living in my head is a really complicated thing. I mean, <laughs> stuff like this flies around in there all the time. <laughs> Case number three is called new and improved. So this is a 72-year-old white male veteran uh, who comes to the pulmonary clinic against his will, brought by his daughter. This guy had recently been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis uh, based on his clinical presentation, radiographic features, and we started him on some perfenidone about a month ago, and he's doing a pretty good job of taking it. He accuses his daughter of interfering with his best efforts to die. Uh, he tells me that he's very active. All he wants to do is work on his farm literally until he keels over and die. He you know, is very frank, saying, I just want to enjoy the time I've got left because I know this is a terrible disease. She's brought him in because she thinks his breathing is worse. He says, no, it's not. It's the exact same. But what's interesting is that while we're having all this discussion, I notice this rash that's new from when uh, I saw him last a month ago. And he tells me it first started on his face, and now it's on his shins and forearms. So here he is, and I think you can see uh, this rash on his, on his face and his arms. So my question for you is, what's the most likely cause for this guy's skin rash. Is it his IPF? Is it sun exposure? Is it skin cancer? Or is it his medications? Yeah, look at that. There are two right answers. Uh, sun exposure and, and his medications. Uh, RT, hanging on to our lead here. So let's talk about this. Um, perfenidone, sold under the trade name Esbriet, uh, got approval by the FDA for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis back in 2015. And it's got what's called fast track approval, which means they studied a lot less rigorously before it got approved by the government to be used. And the reason they did that is because we didn't have any other effective therapies for pulmonary fibrosis. What this also means is that once we start using it, we start to uncover things that normally would have gotten uncovered in clinical trials, right? And that's where we learned about this skin rash and photosensitivity with perfenidone. When you go back and look in the trials that got this medication approved for us to use in our pulmonary fibrosis in teeny, teeny tiny little type, it is buried in there that there was a substantial number of patients, almost a third, who got these photosensitivity-like reactions in the trials that led to, to the, the medication's uh, approval. However, because it was uh, so infrequently bad enough to cause people to stop taking the medications, they really didn't put a lot of emphasis on this. And instead, we find it more often uh, sort of incidentally when our patients come in. Oftentimes, they don't really even notice it. So we need to just do a better job, I would argue, of educating patients on the importance of avoiding the sun as much as they can. This guy needs to have a big floppy hat, long sleeve shirts and using sunblock, none of which he was receptive to. <laughs> Case number four is called a bad day. You ready for this one? This is a 39-year-old guy who got admitted to my ICU for pain control. Doesn't happen often, but every now and then we get somebody who has intractable pain and they want to monitor them in the ICU. And his pain is in his face. So the back story is that he was hiding from the police wedged in the floor joists of his basement. And he didn't listen when they said, come out or we're sending the dog in. So I'll tell you right now, if you've got a queasy stomach, this would be a great time to look at the skyline over there or do some candy crush on your phone or whatever. Three, two, one, you've been warned. So here he is. And I think this lesions make sense if you were wedged in some floor joists with just your head sticking out and a dog came in at you. That's what's going to happen to you. And all that white stuff is insulation that, of course, was crammed in the floor joists. So if this guy were to suddenly develop severe septic shock, 
there's an unusual pathogen that you would need to think about prescribing antibiotics for. What is that unusual pathogen that needs to be covered? Is it a kinococcus? Is it dengue? Is it capnocytophaga? Or is it neglaria? Oh my gosh, did he make all those words up? <laughs> Those are real things. You got five seconds. Uh, just give it your best guess, friends. Yeah, it's capnocytophaga. A kinococcus causes a liver cysts, dengue, you get by mosquito bites, uh, and neglaria is the brain eating amoeba. So I did not make those up. But we're going to talk about capnocytophaga here for a minute. RT still in the lead. Excellent. So what is capnocytophaga? Well, we need to talk about bites first. And it's one of those things that we don't pay a lot of attention to. But, you know, um, there's surprising amount of data on biting species that, that attack humans. And dogs top the list. Humans biting other humans actually come in second. Cats are third, and then rodents are on down the list. If you look, men are more likely to be bitten by dogs, and women are more likely to be bitten by cats. That's a, a, a true, factual, data-driven statement. And when we encounter patients in clinical medicine who've been the victim of a bite, we need to think about three things. What are the bugs in the mouth of whatever did the biting? What are the bugs on the skin of whoever got bitten? And then what are the bugs in the environment? And when we think about the, what's in the mouth of the biter, we need to be thinking about things like pastorella, rabies, right? When we think about what's on the skin, it's usually staph and strep type bugs. But then in the environment, we need to know about clostridium. So these are the things that we need to know about. Uh, and the reason we care about clostridium is because it's what causes tetanus. Did anybody see the news the other night about a kid who survived tetanus and it was all part of this anti-vaccination stuff? So, you know, yet another thing that we have to, to worry about. The problem is, you know, that bites are very dirty, nasty wounds, and uh, the rates of confirming pathogens are really high. Now, the data is not super robust, I'll be completely honest, but this did get published in the New England, New England Journal 20 years ago, and it's the best data we've got. And what it showed us was that these bite wounds are likely to be polymicrobial, so we need to be worried about everything, including the, the kitchen sink here. If you look, about half of the time, there's going to be a mix of aerobes and anaerobes. A third of the time, it's aerobic species alone, very uh, unlikely to be anaerobic alone. But about 10% uh, of the time, we don't grow anything, even though we know it's there. And again, pastorella is the one that we've all been told to worry about. It's in dog saliva. It's in cat saliva. However, we can't forget more typical pathogens and anaerobes. Staph aureus, I would argue, is one of the big things we need to worry about in the year 2019 because MSSA is on our skin, and when we get bitten, it gets pushed down into those uh, deeper tissues. However, streptococci from the biting uh, species mouse is also a really big problem. This is the figure out of that same uh, paper that I was just talking about in the New England Journal, and it showed where we're likely to be bitten. And look at this. Dogs are likely to go after the hand, your thigh, your face, your shoulder. Cats, on the other hand, they go after the hand and the shoulder and not much else. And this kind of makes sense, you know, if you're playing with them or whatever and they, they nip you, this is where you're, you're going to get uh, bit. The problem is... 80% of bite wounds never come to medical attention, so we really don't know how accurate a lot of this epidemiology stuff is. Also not surprising, about half of bites occur in children, and this is usually, you know, the household pet, whether they're teasing it or it was, it's by chance. There's also an interesting phenomenon that more dog bite wounds occur between April and September, and this is actually the origin of the dog days of summer had to do with this spike in bite wounds, so more trivia for you for today. Dog bite wounds are really problematic because although they look dramatic with these big lacerations and the blood and guts hanging out and all that sort of thing, the bigger concern is actually the potential for crush injury. So we tend to be really good at washing things out and sewing it back together, but what if there's a bunch of crush injury underneath there and what you're sewing up is a bunch of dead tissue that's going to be necrotic because those dogs' jaws are so forceful. So you really need to, to think about this because the infection rates will easily double or triple if you've got a bunch of non-debrided tissue under these wounds. 
Now this bug capnocytophagia that was just in the question has gotten a lot more attention in the last six months because there have been some sort of high profile deaths that have occurred. So this was uh, on the national news uh, this last summer about a woman in Wisconsin who died after what should have been, you know, a pretty minor dog bite wound, but she didn't comply with her post-bite antibiotics. This thing got infected. So this is what capnocytophaga looks like under the microscope. It's really difficult to culture because it requires really high carbon dioxide concentrations for growth. So the microlab has to work really hard, uh, which means they need to know that we're suspicious uh, of capnocytophaga. As I've already alluded to, it's part of the normal saliva for dogs and cats, and we can see it in humans too. The good news is it's very sensitive to antibiotics. You can sort of give them just about any antibiotic and it's gonna kill this stuff. The problem is, in susceptible hosts, it can devolve into florid septic shock very quickly. And what we've learned from these recent high-profile cases is that patients who don't have a spleen are the ones who get into trouble with this pathogen. It's not just people who are splenectomized, though. It's also people who have other reasons their immune system doesn't wor work so well. So people with AIDS, people who are on chronic steroid therapy, poorly controlled diabe diabetics, also people who chronically abuse alcohol, have structural lung disease, hematologic malignancies, or the very young and the very old. These are all groups of patients where their immune system doesn't work as optimally as it should, and these are the folks that we're seeing dying from this unusual pathogen. Case number five, dew drops on a rose petal. Have you guys picked up yet that these uh, titles are intended to give you little clues here? Yeah, no, all right. So this is a 38-year-old illegal immigrant uh, from Nicaragua who showed up in the ER with progressive fever and cough that started about a week ago, and it's been slowly worsening. He now has had three days of this itchy skin lesions, and he's treating it with over-the-counter Benadryl, but it's not helping much. No chest pain, no pleurisy, no real sputum, no hemoptysis. His only past medical history is high blood pressure, but he can't afford his medications because he's homeless and living in the shelter downtown. Lots of sick contacts down there. No recent travel, tells you he's been living in the United States for about eight months, no real childhood illnesses, no weird vaccinations or anything like that that he can recall. There's his skin, looks like dew drops on rose petals. And there's his chest x-ray. He got a bronchoscopy that showed this, looking right down his trachea there. So my question is, what do y'all think that we should do next for this guy? Do you think we should call palliative care? Should we send him to the biocontainment unit over at UNMC to hang out with the Ebola patients? Start vancomycin, or start him on acyclovir? Yeah, excellent. Fifteen of you got this. Uh, we're going to start some, some acyclovir here. RT still in the lead. So why are we starting acyclovir in this case? This is varicella pneumonia. So varicella is chickenpox, right? And uh, although chickenpox isn't seen in adults very commonly, we need to be aware that adult cases are increasing, and when you see the disease in adults, it's way more likely to severe. Uh, way more likely to be severe. And for us as pulmonologists, we dread seeing this because varicella pneumonia develops with a surprisingly high frequency in these folks. The risk factors for developing that pneumonia is if they've ever been a smoker, if they have greater than 100 lesions on their skin, or if they're pregnant, particularly in the third trimester. Those are the folks that we really lose sleep over. What we've learned is that if you put these folks, uh, adults who develop varicella, on antiviral therapy, specifically acyclovir, look at their mortality. 7%, which should scare us, but look at what happens if we don't give them antiviral treatment. Their mortality is up on the order of 20%. If they develop pneumonia and it's so bad they land on a ventilator, we should really be terrified because it's a coin flip whether or not they're going to survive. So again, another thing to think about in this era of anti-vaxxers and all of that sort of thing, this is certainly going to be a problem for us, just like what we're seeing with measles and what we saw with that case of tetanus here recently. Case number six, I'm all in. 
So you're the night nurse in the ICU, and the telemetry folks call and say, hey, two of your patients have been in persistent sinus attack. I know you hear the alarm going off, but this has been going on since noon, so can we deal with it? You get some labs, and everything looks unchanged from this morning when they weren't tachycardic. You've called the physician, and he's giving you multiple orders uh, that aren't working. So you've already uh, increased the pain control and the sedation. You gave a diltiazem bolus and then started a diltiazem infusion. And you pushed some IV beta blockers, and nothing is bringing down the heart rates. So my question for you is, what do you think we should do now for these two tachycardic patients in the ICU? You want to start amiodarone, rebolus them with diltiazem, uh, load with digoxin, or you want to do something else? Yeah, 16 of you think we should do something else, and, and I agree. Oh, no, RT got knocked off the perch there. Look at that. Look at that. Don't give up, everybody. So what should we do now? Well, we should get chest x-rays. Why? What do you see when you look at these x-rays? You see that both of them have new pick lines, and if you follow the tips of these pick lines... They are really deep. They're down in the heart. They're not up in the vena cava at the cavoatrial junction where we want them. So this is one of those things that, you know, we get chest x-rays for line placement all the time, but nobody ever talks about what really is the right line placement, right? Well, I'll call the doctor and it's their problem. Well, let me show you what we, the physicians, are supposed to do when we put the lines in. So we talked earlier about how the trachea comes down and the carina sits here where we'd have the division to the right and left <coughs> lung. And you can see these shadows. This is a crappy projection here, but you can usually see a dark stripe that's the trachea and you can see this little notch, which is the carina. So what people should do is sort of draw a line here at the level of the carina. And when you see a pick line coming down, it should terminate just above this right main stem bronchus or about halfway through the diameter of that bronchus. If it's here to down here, we're in the right location. If it's up too high, it's in a, a vessel up there where it could erode through the wall and then we're calling the thoracic surgeon and they're not going to be happy with us. That's bad. Or in these cases, as we just saw, if it's too far, it's down in the right atrium and it's stimulating the wall of the right atrium, which is where your pacemaker sits, and you develop this persistent tachycardia. So all we need to do in these cases is pull the line back and the tachycardia magically gets better. Case number seven, perfect is the enemy of good enough. So we got a 67-year-old guy with diabetes, hypertension, and coronary disease. He shows up with 14 hours of chest pain. He's a veteran, so what does he say? It's exactly like my last heart attack, Doc. Substernal pressure going down his left arm, maybe a little into his neck. They give him some sublingual nitrogen, and it goes away. His troponin comes back 7.3. His EKG is markedly abnormal. We'll look at it here in a second. And he refuses cardiac catheterization. Not interested just want to be managed with medications. So here's his EKG, and we can see these ST elevations, right? This is the real deal with his story, his enzymes, that EKG. So the ER has already given supplemental oxygen at four liters a minute, gave him an aspirin to chew up and swallow. He's got his heparin bolus and drip. He's on <coughs> nitroglycerin now. He's got a couple of pushes of PRN morphine. They started a beta blocker and high dose statin therapy. The question is, which of these conventional therapies might actually have been the wrong thing to do? Is it the heparin drip, the aspirin, the oxygen administration, or the nitroglycerin. It's actually the oxygen. Look at that. Two people. Two people. BD. Look at this. This is fascinating. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Everybody says, what? What? Oxygen? Oxygen's the elixir of the gods. Well, there was this fascinating study that was done uh, a couple of years ago that now has uh, been replicated by other folks. I always like to give the credit to the first people who describe something, right? So what these Australians did was they took patients who the squad goes out to get them, and it's clear they're having an ST elevation MI, and they randomized them on their way to the hospital to the oxygen group or the no oxygen group. And there's 200 and change people with ST elevation MIs in each of these two groups. And what they looked to study was how bad is the infarct if you got oxygen versus if you didn't get oxygen. Because we've all been taught 
oxygen's going to make the infarct smaller, right? That's not what they showed. So if you look at what happens, these are the patients who got oxygen. These are the patients who didn't get oxygen. If you look at what happens to their CK levels, significantly higher if you got oxygen. And if you look at the troponin, significantly higher if you got oxygen than if you didn't. But MIs aren't all just about biomarkers, right? So they looked at all of these other outcomes, and they found that, you know, all the things that they looked at uh, there was trends suggesting that the no oxygen patients did better. They then took them down uh, six months after their MI and did MRIs of their heart to see how big the scar in their heart was from the MI they had six months ago. And they showed that they were larger in the patients who got oxygen therapy than the folks who didn't get oxygen therapy. So essentially what we've learned in MIs and now several other disease states is that oxygen certainly helps some people, but too much of it may be harmful. So there's this movement now called oxygen too much of a good thing, talking about being judicious in who we give oxygen to and how much oxygen we give them. So if you look at the recommendations, it says, yeah, oxygen, if they're below 92%, with the goal of getting them above 94%, but we don't want to turn it up to 8 or 10 or 12 liters and have everybody sitting there with sats uh, of 100% based on this. And you could say, well, why? That doesn't make any sense. Well, realize that oxygen can uh, break down from O2, that's what oxygen is, right? to free radicals, where it's the O2 breaks into two unique oxygen uh, atoms. Those things uh, are very toxic to a lot of tissue. So the concern is that by giving people these supraphysiologic oxygen levels, we increase the number of those free radicals that then go on to harm tissues. And in critically ill patients, like an MI patient, that may be what's driving this. I'm not telling you that's what's going on, but there is sort of a, at least a theory that would make sense on why too much oxygen may be harmful in a lot of these pro-inflammatory disease states like an MI. Case number eight, we got a 32-year-old woman who shows up with hemoptysis. That's not good. She's had chronic cough, says she's had multiple bouts of pneumonia. She's been put on every antibiotic under the sun. It never really seems to get a whole lot better. The only other problem that she has, despite a lengthy history, is that she's got recurrent urinary tract infections, all of which show up as hematuria. And similarly, she gets put on antibiotics for these UTIs, and it doesn't really get a whole lot better. She doesn't take any medications. Uh, so the reason she got sent to us was because that's her x-ray. So I don't know about you all, but I see what looks like a big cavitary lesion, the hole in the center, maybe another one here. If we look over here, really dense lesion, but again, these cannonballs that look hollow in the middle, right? I mean, different sizes, both lungs. So what's the best thing for us to do now? Hemoptysis, UTIs abnormal chest x-ray, call palliative care, consult oncology, bronchoscopy, or give her some more antibiotics. I'm glad nobody chose palliative care. She's 32 years old, right? <laughs> oncology, she may need that, but we don't know what her diagnosis is. The antibiotics haven't worked, so I'm probably not going to do that. Oh, by the way, I'm a pulmonologist, and this is a pulmonary conference, so the answer is always bronchoscopy, right? <laughs> BD is still in the lead here by, by, a, by a thread, I would argue. So when we did the bronchoscopy, what did we get? Well, when you do a bronchoscopy, one of the things we can do uh, with the scope is a bronchoalveolar lavage. With a BAL, we take 50 mLs of saline and push it out through the scope, let it percolate around for a couple of breaths, and we slurp it back. And we usually don't get very much fluid. Most of it sort of hangs out in the airways, runs out into the alveoli. But in this girl, when we did our first slurp back of the BAL fluid, we got a little bit, and it looked... Uh, uh, sort of pale red here. We then push another 50 mLs of saline out, and what happens when you do that is whatever was left behind from the first 50 mLs, you push it even further out, let it sort of mix around, and then we suck back. So now we tend to get more fluid after the second aliquot than the first one. And look what happened. It got more red than the first aliquot. 
Well, then we push a third aliquot of 50 ml, so we're ideally pushing all of that fluid out to the alveoli, letting it mix around. And then when we aspirate back, we get a, usually an even larger volume of fluid here, and it looks like cranberry juice. So when you see this pinkish to reddish to cranberry juice sort of phenomenon, this progressive reddening, it tells you that you have alveolar hemorrhage. There's blood out in the alveoli. Alveoli have to get really, really angry to, to bleed, and the differential diagnosis changes quite a bit in these folks. Now remember, she had the hematuria too, right? So we thought, well, there's something going on in the lungs probably is tied to the kidneys if they're both bleeding. So she got a biopsy of her kidneys, just a needle through there, and this is a glomerulus here, and we can see these areas of dead, bloody, necrotic um, uh, glomeruli here. So what we have is a pulmonary vascular syndrome where they're both uh, dead, dying, and, and bloody. And what this represents is a vasculitis. Now, vasculitis is one of those things that we don't talk about a lot because we don't see it a lot. But we need to talk about it more because it's really easy to attribute the symptoms to recurrent infections in her, and she got antibiotics and more antibiotics, and that's never going to fix her problem, right? So when things go off the rails, we need to think differently, and vasculitis needs to be on our differential diagnosis. When a patient shows up with vasculitis, we have to do two things. We have to assess how active it is. And in her case, she's bleeding into her alveoli. She's bleeding into her glomeruli. It's very active, right? We got to put a stop to that. Once we do that, then the second thing we need to do is measure how much damage has this done over time. And we need to be thinking about both of these things, realizing that they're both going to change uh, as their disease progresses along. The problem with vasculitides is that, number one, the drugs we use to treat them are brutal. We've got to immunosuppress the heck out of people to shut off that inflammation. So when we put people on these drugs, it uh, you know, oftentimes leads to osteoporosis and opportunistic infection. So now they're not just on the immune suppressing drugs, they're on drugs to deal with the aftermath of those. Second. Their monitoring is intense. They're coming in every few weeks to get lab testing. They're getting intermittent images to look at you know, smoldering disease. And if they've got pulmonary vasculitis, they're coming in all the time to get pulmonary function tests. And then what invariably happens is that this vasculitis affects multiple organs in their body. So they end up seeing every single subspecialist under the sun. And we know what happens when uh, care gets fragmented like this. So what we try and do is have some sort of tools to keep us focused on monitoring this, and this is the combined damage assessment for vasculitis. So it goes organ system by organ system and shows you everything that needs to be looked at. So I think right there it should highlight what a devastating problem vasculitides can be. And if you look at the damage that can happen over time when vasculitis occurs in the lungs, it can lead to all sorts of very problematic badness, as you see listed on the slide. This table shows the uh, major complaints that these patients with vasculitides will develop uh, over time. This is specific to Wegener's. Uh, which is what this patient has. And when you look at these problematic symptoms for the patients, we see that a ton of these are related to the respiratory system, whether it's upper or lower respiratory system. It's really diffusely involved in causing lots of problems. This is a disease that has a huge amount of burden on the patients, and it's really problematic to take care of because there's overlap between a lot of these vasculitis syndromes that are out there. I'll spare you the painful details, but this 32-year-old woman ultimately was found to have Wegener's granulomatosis. So my next cahoot for you is why are we now changing the name of Wegener's granulomatosis? We've known it for that as decades, and now we're changing. Is it because of tax fraud? Is it because of the Nazis? Is it because of academic fraud? Or is it because of murder? You're the one who told me I could talk about whatever I want. Don't, don't sit there and give me stink eye like that. <laughs> Only one person got it, the Nazis. Yeah, the Nazis. Uh, 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 Frederick Wegener was a, a pathologist who first described what we now call Wegener's granulomatosis. Everybody loved the guy. He was awesome. Did all this great stuff. In 1989, the American College of Chess Physicians gave him their most prestigious award, the Master Clinician Award, and then he died the following year. 
In 2000, the, the very prestigious journal Lancet came and said to a bunch of pulmonary and rheumatology folks, we want to write a piece to honor this guy. And when they did, they started to learn that he had ties to the Nazis. And the more they dug, it was really horrible. He willingly joined the Nazi party. He wasn't one of the physicians who had to in order to keep practicing medicine. He went along with this completely, and some details uh, suggested that not only was he part of the, no the Nazi party, he actually participated in the horrific experimentation that they did on the Jews in the, the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, there was actually a warrant out by the Polish government for him for, for war crimes. So uh, we've now changed the name from Wegener's granulomatosis to ANCA associated granulo granulomatous vasculitis to try and be sensitive to his, his uh, dodgy past. So just realize you're still going to see that Wegener's granulomatosis moniker probably forever, but the more PC amongst us try and use the ANCA associated granulomatous vasculitis. Case number nine, another case of uh, hematemesis. This is a 62-year-old guy with known alcoholic liver disease and varices. He shows up with a hemoglobin of 5.8. That is really low, folks. GI gets called and they say, yeah, we're on our way. We're kind of tied up. So in the meantime, you need to start aggressively giving fluid resuscitation and transfuse some packed red blood cells. So the question is, what's the fastest way uh, of the choices I'm going to give you to get these fluid and PRBCs in. Is it all three lumens on a triple lumen catheter wide open, so an 18 gauge, an 18 gauge, and a 16 gauge? Is it a single 20 gauge peripheral IV in the left antecube, a single 16 gauge in the right antecube, or an eight and a half French cordis catheter in the IJ? Oh, only three people got it right. Yeah, this is, um, this is, uh, intentionally here to, to trick folks because we find ourselves uh, arguing with our friendly nurses in the ICU every now and then because you know we got a patient who's got a couple of IVs in and they're bleeding out and they're like we need a triple lumen and we're like triple lumens are lousy ways to resuscitate folks so this is the table showing the maximal flow rates you can get on different catheters so if I put a dinky little 22 gauge in somebody the maximum flow rate you're going to get through it is 38 cc's a minute if I go from a 22 to a 20 gauge, look at that, it almost doubles to 63. If I go from a 20 to an 18, again, it almost doubles up to 110. And if I go to a 16 gauge, it doubles again to around 215. So if a triple lumen is an 18 gauge plus an 18 gauge plus a 16 gauge, most people would think that would be 110 plus 110 plus 215. But it's not just about how big the gauge is, it's how long the catheter is. And the length is a way bigger rate limiting factor than the gauge. So even though I've got three lumens and they're all really good size, my flow rate is actually less than if I had a single 18 gauge peripheral IV. So when you make that call and you ask you know, for somebody to throw a central line in for you, we're not being obstructionist, it's just that they're really lousy for resuscitation. It's good to have multiple lumens, so you give many meds all at once, but you're just not going to get the fast rate that you need. So a cordis is an eight and a half French catheter, a pretty big guy, but again, it suffers from the fact that it's long like a, like a triple lumen catheter, and because of that, it's a, a, a pretty puny flow rate. We have a rapid infusion catheter, which is the same eight and a half French as a cordis, but rather than being that long like a cordis, it's that long like an IV. So look what happens to your flow rate. It goes up fivefold by having a short catheter. I think this is the last case here, Lisa. I know I went over, but I started late, so you got to cut me a little slack. 70-year-old guy. Uh, he's a farmer. He shows up with a cough. He tells you that he expectorates about two cups of sputum every day and that it's worse in the mornings when he gets up occasionally has some streaky hemoptysis, and oh, by the way, brought in a sample for us to look at. You love that, don't you? There you go. Oh, everybody groans. So what's your diagnosis? You got a cup of slime. What is the diagnosis? Is it empyema? Is it fungal pneumonia? Is it bacterial pneumonia? Or does this guy have bronchiectasis?
Yeah, he's got bronchiectasis for sure. Oh, we, we got a dog fight. Look at that, 17 point difference here. So why is this bronchiectasis? Well, bronchiectasis just means that you've got this abnormal dilation of the, the bronchi and the, the branches. So if this is what it normally looks like over here, this is what bronchiectasis looks like. And you can imagine these things fill up with mucus that gets infected, it leads to more bronchiectasis, which leads to more nasty mucus over time, and it becomes this vicious cycle here. Now, the congenital form uh, of bronchiectasis is cystic fibrosis. We all are familiar with that. But realize that in childhood, if you get certain infections, including measles, that can cause you over the years to develop bronchiectasis. And in adults, you can again have infections and tuberculosis coming in here can, can cause this. However, it's more likely to be associated with bronchial tumors or some sort of environmental exposure. So, next trivia question, how many cystic fibrosis mutations are there? Never thought about it, right? Are there one, ten, a hundred, or a thousand? Ooh. Yeah, there's over a thousand mutations for cystic fibrosis, although people think that, you know, there's not very many. There's actually a ton. So B, D, R, T, and Deb, come up, get these uh, cards um, while I get us over here to our talk. Big round of applause. Who's who? BD, RT, and Deb. Way to go. I hope you like coffee. If not, uh, sell it to somebody else, I guess. Excellent. So a few words on bronchiectasis and sputum. What I, the reason I showed you that cup is because this is what they come up with. It's the classic three layers of sputum here. So up on top, you got this bubbly foam. Then in the middle, we got this watery stuff. And then you got frank pus or sediment down in the bottom. So you know, really what you're seeing is saliva is the bubbles. Uh, saliva plus some bronchial secretions is the liquid. And then the chronic infection is the pus down there. But you know, if they don't cough it out, they can get these bronchial casts. I pulled this out of somebody with the bronchoscope. Or the inflammation can cause bleeding, and you can get these rubbery, bloody casts. It's really the same thing as what you see over here just now with some blood in it. We have four treatment options uh, in bronchiectasis, with one a fifth that I added with a question mark. Really, the goals are treat the underlying cause, help them figure out how to get the mucus out of their lungs, control infection, and then try and reverse any airflow obstruction. So I've got slides in here, and you guys can have all of these. This is the evolution of the bronchi hygiene measures. We used to give cystic fibrosis kids these flutter valves that they'd take a deep breath and blow as hard as they can and there's a little steel ball in there that raises and falls as they blow and it creates a fluttering sensation that loosens the secretions. Well we then went to these things that we all called the pickle where again they blow through it and it's got a spring valve on here that again causes a fluttering sensation as they exhale and now really what we're giving people are these devices here that are battery powered and they cause a fluttering sensation using electronical manipulations. So with that, my time is up. Again, the summary of teaching points are all here for you, starting with the most important, don't swallow live catfish. Thanks for your time, everybody. Appreciate your attention.